Okay, so can we please talk about how McDonald's is responsible for one of the biggest conspiracies? Yes, McDonald's. It became a massive FBI investigation and involved one of the biggest Italian mob families in New York. Well, around 1987, there was a little bit of a decline in the fast food industry. And McDonald's was really feeling it. So they were like, oh my gosh, how can we improve our sales? And this is when they decided to partner with Simon Marketing. And they had some amazing business ideas. They helped them come up with the Happy Meal and they helped them come out with the Monopoly game. I don't know if you guys remember this, but I used to play it a lot as a kid. You would get this little sticker that you could peel off on the back of drinks, boxes. It would offer you a free Big Mac, a drink upgrade, but some of them offered way bigger prizes, like jet skis, cars, all the way up to a million dollars. Yeah, I never found one of those, but you could always bring it back and add it to your Monopoly board. And anyone could participate, even if you didn't buy anything from them. Like you could just go in and ask for a chip or else it would have been considered gambling. And McDonald's sales jumped 40%, so they were making bank. But it didn't take long for someone to tip off the FBI. Part two on the McDonald's conspiracy. So the thing about their Monopoly game is that it was a one in 250 million chance of winning. That is less than the lottery. But one day the FBI was tipped off that the past three winners were from the same family. Like that's actually impossible. And the name that was dropped for who was controlling all of this was Uncle Jerry. Obviously this is a massive accusation to make. So the FBI was like, okay, let's look into this. And what do you know, all of the recent winners were from the Jacksonville area. So they were like, okay, is it someone at Mickey D's? Makes the boxes, delivers it. Either way, they had to call an immediate meeting with the McDonald's company. They didn't tell them why. They were just like, hey, you guys need to come down here. I would be scared out of my mind if the FBI didn't tell me why they needed me. But the second the employees got there and sat down, they presented them with the case. And they were shocked. They were like, that is absolutely not possible. It's so rare to win this game, they should not be coming from the same area. And it was causing a major freak out. But luckily, the timing was perfect because they were about to release their next Monopoly game. And this way, they could catch someone in the act. Part three on the McDonald's conspiracy. So what exactly is a conspiracy? It's a secret plan made by a group to do something harmful or unlawful. And it didn't take long for this next Monopoly game to have a new winner. His name was Michael Hoover. The FBI decided to make a fake production company to act like they were doing a big commercial for him winning when they were actually secretly interrogating him. So they were asking him questions. He went into detail on how he found the chip, how he was gonna buy a boat and name it Ruthless Scandal. And then the FBI being one step ahead had already tapped him. So when he left, they heard his phone call which he basically laughed and said that he pulled it off, that they actually think he's gonna buy a boat called Ruth's Scandal. But they hear the name Uncle Jerry talked about again. So they had to do a deeper dive into who was working for them. And well, the company they partnered with, Simon Marketing, there was a guy who was head of security named Jerome Jacobson. He oversaw the whole process. Not only did he head all of security, but he also designed it as well. On top of this, he was responsible for taking the chip to the McDonald's location. But if the process was so thorough, how was he pulling it off? Part four to the McDonald's conspiracy. So what exactly made them suspicious of Jerome Jacobson? Well, the people that were getting the chips were all around where he lived. Like his nephew, his butcher, which like, how can you be that stupid? You need to actually be spreading these out. But essentially what he was doing when he was on his way to those McDonald's locations was stopping at the airport bathroom, breaking the seal, taking the piece out and resealing it and leaving the bathroom. So he walked out with the prize piece and he was selling them off. For example, he sold one worth 200000 or 45000 to his nephew. Obviously, he realized it was looking a little sketchy, so he decided to get someone else involved named Jerry Colombo. I know it's a little confusing because they're both Jerry. And he belonged in one of the five crime families that dominated New York. He wanted to promise his daughter a chip. And if you didn't know this, that's why Jerome Jacobson was being called Uncle Jerry. I guess uncle is a term of respect in the mafia. And together, they all teamed up to pick other winners, like Gloria Brown, who paid forty grand for a million-dollar chip. And even Jerry Colombo himself got a Dodge Viper. With all this info, the FBI was about to make their arrest. Part five to the McDonald's conspiracy. The last place that Jerry sent it to before he was caught was St. Jude's Children's Hospital. I guess he decided to do something positive with his chips, but they did use that to track him down. And yes, McDonald's did let the Children's Hospital keep the million dollar chip. But Uncle Jerry was being followed by about 25 FBI agents and was officially caught. Him and eight others were arrested and five were indicted for collecting false prize. Jerome Jacobson had stolen up to 60 game pieces. He served 35 months in prison and had to pay 12.5 million in restitution. He's free though now and in his 70s. Jerry Colombo actually died in a car accident, so he was not arrested. And there's a lot of stuff around that being an inside job. It was a really sketchy car accident. Sometimes you just don't know with the mafia. Well, Simon Marketing and McDonald's sued each other back and forth. But Burger King responded by suing McDonald's for false advertising a promotion while knowing that the game was compromised. And they eventually just dropped the case. McDonald's started to give away a lot of cash prizes in response. And they officially stopped the game in 2016. Let me know what other conspiracies you want to hear about.
So I am beyond fascinated by this conspiracy theory. First, I'm going to be showing you guys a series of images and let me know in the comments how they make you feel. I was introduced to liminal spaces whenever I was first on TikTok. The sound St. Bernard by Lincoln was going viral at the time with people putting their near-death experiences and saying that this is what they saw after they died. In all of the comment sections, people seem to be describing this place as ominous, yet nostalgic, as if we've all been here before. Well, the next time that I was introduced to these, it was going viral with the Daisy song. It honestly just unlocks a whole other creepy feeling. And everyone was stating that this is what their dreams look like. So why do everyone with different experiences, different lives, all feel that this is familiar? As if we're unlocking a shared stowed away memory. Well, a post that went viral on 4chan was describing these as the back rooms. What exactly is a back room? Well, in a video game, it's essentially when you no clip out of reality. Like you're passing through the limits of what you're supposed to see. So what would that mean for reality and why are back rooms there? Part two to liminal spaces in the back rooms. So the next question that we're gonna be answering is why do back rooms exist? These yellow decaying walls are providing people with nostalgia for a time they've never even known. Well, basically it's a glitch. Have you ever lost something for days and then been able to find it again? Or maybe a bird flying in place or the Mandela effect or photos of people who look like they're time travelers. Either way, these cases defy the laws of reality. So these examples, along with finding the back rooms, are glitches. And a glitch would suggest that we're potentially in a simulation. Psychologist Carl Jung actually described our world as an unconscious manifestation that materializes. The best example that I can think of is Coraline. Think of whenever she's with the other mother. Everything that Coraline unconsciously desired is manifested. The other mother is the creator and knows exactly what to make in order to entice her. And whenever she goes out of the bounds of what's created, things start to turn to another color. Essentially, she's glitched out of reality and in her own back room. So is our universe just a projection for us, similar to how Coraline's universe was projected as well? Part three to liminal spaces and back rooms and trigger warning, we will be talking about simulation theory. So are we just living in one big giant Sims game? We have very highly developed artificial intelligence and it continues to get better every day. And we are starting to have the ability to be able to create things that have awareness. I don't know if you guys saw that snake on your For You page that thought it was alive, but that's like the example that I'm gonna give. How do we know that we are not in this as well? Honestly, we don't. We just have to believe that we are real in order to live in a simulation. Like my Sims do not know that I'm controlling them. Even Mr. Musk has stated with the rate of any improvement at all that games will be indistinguishable from reality. So who's controlling my life? Cause they need to do a better job. If you are spiritual like I am, this also doesn't disprove the theory that we have a creator. It's just more of a programmer. Either way, it's just a theory. And if you guys wanna go over to my Instagram page, I'm gonna be talking about the levels to the back rooms. If you click on my middle tab right here, you will see the videos. And let me know what you think of this theory and what theories you want me to talk about next. Story time about how my mom made me shave my hair off. So a little background information, I was 13 years old and in seventh grade. And I had just moved to a new school this year because my grandma was really sick and my family and I needed to take care of her. And for like the first two months, I had a big problem making friends until I met my best friends, Ashley and Nicole. Ashley was super sweet and Nicole was kind of a bitch. And I was in between, so we kind of all balanced each other out. But fast forward to later on in the year, we met this one girl named Kelly. And I'm not gonna lie, she was super nice, but really annoying. She would always try to talk to us, always try to hang out with us. She was literally stuck up our asses 24 seven. And the one day Ashley convinced Nicole and I to have a sleepover with Kelly and her. So we say yes, and Nicole, Ashley, and I are all texting in the group chat and Nicole goes well I'm not gonna promise that I'm gonna be nice to her and she actually said that we were gonna play a prank on her and that's when Ashley bailed because she didn't want to be a part of it like for part two part two about why my mom made me shave my hair off so like I said, Ashley bailed because she did not want to be a part of Nicole's evil plan to bully this girl. So fast forward, Nicole and I go over to Kelly's house and I start to feel really bad because Kelly's actually super nice and she wasn't as weird as I thought she was. Fast forward, Kelly's sleeping and Nicole comes over to me and she's like, hey, come to the bathroom with me. So I get up and I go to the bathroom and Nicole pulls out Nair. And I asked her what the hell she's gonna do with that. And she was like, oh, I've seen some people do pranks on YouTube. You know, they put it in somebody's shampoo bottle and then it makes them lose their hair. So since I'm the only one who thinks logically, I'm like, Nicole, you cannot fucking do that. And she's like, oh, don't be such a baby. This shit doesn't even work anyways. All the videos that I watched, people only lost like four strands of hair, which made no sense because why the fuck were we going to do it then? Anyways, fast forward. I go to sleep. I wake up in the morning and my mom comes to get me. Like for part three. Part three about why my mom made me shave my hair off. 
So, like I said, Nicole put the Nair in her shampoo, and I went to sleep. I decided I was not going to be a part of this little plan, and I wake up in the morning. My mom comes and picks me up, and Ashley's texting me saying, hey, was Nicole nice to Kelly? And I told her about what she did, and Ashley was like, oh my god, that's so fucked up. Like, I'm going to tell Kelly... And I was like, yeah, I was going to tell her, but I don't want to get Nicole in trouble. So fast forward to dinner time, my mom gets a call from Kelly's mom. And she was like, Kelly took a shower earlier. She's losing her hair. And Nicole texted Kelly saying that your daughter's the one who put the shit in my daughter's shampoo. So my mom's like, well, how do you know it was my daughter? And she was like, Nicole also said that she saw the Nair bottle in your daughter's backpack. So my mom runs up to my room. She finds the Nair bottle in my stuff, which obviously Nicole put there. But my mom wouldn't listen to me so eventually she sat me down in the kitchen and shaved my hair story time about my extremely creepy neighbors so a little background information i was 12 years old and i was in sixth grade and my family and i lived in a really small town where everyone knew everyone but our new neighbors had been building their house next to us for the past four years and finally when they were done with the house this house was huge i mean probably because there were like eight people moving into the house there was the mom the dad four kids and their grandparents so like eight people. But I was super excited because I was like, okay, this is awesome. I get to meet some new friends. But after two weeks of not seeing anybody playing in the backyard or anybody on the school bus, I started to think that their family was super fucking weird. And everyone in our neighborhood liked to gossip. And everyone was saying how they barely see the people who had just moved in. So my mom decided to take one for the team and make some brownies, take them over to the house. And I ended up going with her. So we go up to the house, we knock on the door. And one of the kids came and opened the door, but the dad ran over and grabbed him like for part two part two about my extremely creepy neighbors so like i said my mom and i took some brownies over there and one of the kids opened the door and when he opened the door he had a bunch of bruises all over his body the dad came running over and ripped his son from the door and slammed the door in our faces and all you could hear was him screaming at his son so my mom and i went to walk away before the door opened and he was like sorry my son knows better than to open the door to strangers so he took the brownies and then i asked him if i could have a sleepover with one of his daughters and he was super hesitant at first but he said that i could only have a sleepover with her if it was at my house and not theirs which my mom was completely fine with anyways because she thought that it was a little bit weird that his son had bruises covering his whole body so that night when she came over to sleep over my house i asked her how her brother got all those bruises all over his body and she said that he just fell down some stairs but after that we became best friends and we would literally hang out like five times a week until the one day i knocked on their door to ask if she wanted to come over and her dad answered the door and said that she was gone like for part three part three about my super creepy neighbors so like I said, I became best friends with their daughter, but the one day I went over her house to ask if she wanted to come over and her dad answered the door and said that she was gone. And when I asked when she would be back, he was like, she went to go live with her mom, so probably never. Which was super weird because she never mentioned that she had another mom. So fast forward two months, my family and I are sitting around the fire pit when we hear someone scream help. But we weren't sure if that's what we were actually hearing because it was so quiet. And then all of a sudden we heard someone banging on my neighbor's basement door. You know those metal doors that people usually have outside of their house that lead down basement steps? Yeah, well that's where the banging was coming from. So my dad hopped over the fence to see if that's where the screaming was coming from also. And then not even a minute later, my dad hopped back over the fence and it looked like he saw a ghost. But he ran inside, called 911 because i was so young the only thing my parents told me about that whole situation was that the girl that i was friends with was still alive and her parents were keeping her in the basement along with two of her other siblings but then we also found out that they weren't even her real parents they were kidnapped at the hospital when they were born imagine resorting to murdering your spouse after only eight days of marriage today we're going to be talking about the murder of cody johnson a backstory into his life. He was born on April 8th, 1998, was very outdoorsy, loved cars, got a career in making custom commercial cars, and his boss was his best friend. He had an awesome relationship with his family, with his friends, an amazing job that he loved, but all he really wanted was a wife to go along with it. Well, in Halloween of 2011, he met Jordan Graham. She was a huge Christian, very active in the church, but she was also very shy and reserved. But this attracted Cody to her. They were like yin and yang, perfect opposites. And Cody knew he was gonna marry her after just a few weeks of knowing Jordan. He fell so hard, but a lot of their friends and family was noticing that Jordan wasn't falling quite as hard. And it's very important that I state that because of Jordan's religious views, celibacy was huge for her. So Jordan and Cody decided to buy a house and get married. It was very noticeable that Jordan was more excited about the wedding though than the marriage. Time for the wedding, this is when things took a turn for the worse. Part two to the murder of Cody Johnson. Well, the day of the wedding hit and they had a custom song made for their wedding. 
And it stated things like, you're my safe place to fall. You help me to climb higher for a better view. And this is all a massive foreshadow. After their wedding, Cody took a week off of work as their honeymoon period to move into their new house. Well, the day before this honeymoon period was over was a Sunday. So they went to church, went to the lake, and went out to Dairy Queen with some friends. And this was the last time anyone heard from Cody. The next day occurred and he didn't show up to work. His boss, who again was also his best friend, was extremely worried. So worried that he went to his house and when he knocked on the door for a while and no one answered, he resorted to breaking in. He was panicked, looked for evidence around the house and found Cody's phone in the garage. But there was no sign of Jordan. Absolutely panicked, he called the police. Because of how worried his boss was, the police took this very seriously. They were also wondering why his wife didn't make this report. While the wife ended up texting a friend asking if they had seen Cody, saying that he drove off with out of town friends and didn't know where he went. Part three to the murder of Cody Johnson. So at this point, friends and family know that Cody is missing. So they go to Cody and Jordan's house to help. And when they're over there, Jordan just seems upset instead of happy that people are actually helping. At one point, she gets so upset that she throws her wedding ring. Well, obviously with this behavior, the police call her in to question her. They're like, hey, was there a fight? She says no. They're like, well, like, do you think you know where he went? She's like, well, he does like to go out on very fast joy rides, almost suggesting that they were going too fast and maybe crashed somewhere. She also said that she didn't make a missing persons report in case he came back and was upset with her. Well, the cops were potentially thinking that this was a drug deal gone wrong because that wasn't uncommon for the area. Search parties were looking for Cody everywhere until an email came in. I'll insert this email now from Cody the car man. And Jordan originally showed this email to her friend. And it was her friend who encouraged her to take this email to the cops instead of her just doing it herself. It stated that his body was in Glacier National Park. But when she took this to the police, she showed no emotion. But they still decided to search there. Part four to the murder of Cody Johnson. So whenever Jordan brought this email to them, she claimed that he did work with the Cody. And when they found this Cody and interviewed him, he said that he hadn't worked with him in a long time. He also was extremely cooperative and they couldn't find any evidence against him. They also could not tie that email to him. So they take their search to Glacier National Park. Jordan brings her friend Hannah and they walk around with a search party looking at different areas. But again, Jordan's very unemotional and not even helping. Her friend was just trying to be as supportive as possible. Well, they couldn't find him, so they went home, called it a day, and came back the next day. And Jordan brought her little brother with her. And as they're driving through, Hannah is suggesting places that the search party should go to. But Jordan ends up having another idea. She takes them on a very long road to the top where a parking lot is and states that her and Cody went here a lot. This area was beautiful and scenic, but dangerous and the rocks for the hikers were not approved. But everyone watched as Jordan jumped over the railing and onto the rocks, went to a specific edge of a small cliff, throws a rock over the edge and states, I think he's down there. Part five to the murder of Cody Johnson. So Jordan throws the rock over the edge and states, OMG, it's him. Her little brother joins her and kind of looks over the edge. And it's just past the point that you can't see, but you can definitely see that something's down there. Which traumatized her little brother and he was so upset that he was physically crawling back to the car and crying. And again, Jordan was emotionless. And everyone was shocked by her behavior and the fact that she knew the right place to go. A member of the FBI had to actually climb down the tree by rope in order to confirm that there was a body down there before they even started the rescue mission because of how dangerous the rescue mission would be. But once they were able to go there, they confirmed that it was him, he had his ID on him, and a helicopter had to come drop a 200 foot line to retrieve him. All of Cody's friends and family stated that he was afraid of heights, so he had to have been lured there. The police thought it was very suspicious that Jordan knew exactly where to go. And when questioned on this, she said the whole Holy Spirit just led her to this spot. Now they're super weirded out but still don't have evidence against her. And this is when her matron of honor ended up coming forward with text messages about Jordan being scared to get married. Part six to the murder of Cody Johnson. So the matron of honor ended up coming forward with all of these text messages in which Jordan was saying that she was scared to get married and scared to lose her virginity. She was also crying the day of her wedding and stated that she would freak out if he even made a move on her. Well, I guess after they got married, she pretended like she was on her period. But obviously that lie can only last for so long. So she told her friend that she ended up telling Cody she didn't want to be with him anymore after eight days of marriage, that they got into an argument and he left. So now the police know that she's telling different people different things. On top of that, they were able to trace the IP address of the email back to her stepdad's house. So that's when Jordan knew it was time to come clean. She said she told Cody she wasn't happy anymore and they got into a huge argument, but decided to cool off a little bit at the national park, in which they got into an altercation again and she pushed him off the cliff, which didn't surprise investigators at this point. Jordan then went to his funeral and was on her phone the entire time and finally was arrested for first and second degree murder, but was only convicted for second degree and sentenced to 30 years in which she didn't testify or apologize. Because of her Christian background, she made it seem like it was worse to just divorce. Story time about how my sister was hooking up with my boyfriend. 
little background information i was 15 and in 10th grade and i have never had a boyfriend before any guy that i was sort of talking to we never made it out of the talking stage but fast forward i met this one guy who we're gonna call jake and because of how tragic my love life was i didn't expect us to get into a relationship but he ended up asking me to be his girlfriend so of course i said yes i was super excited that i had a boyfriend and then he met my family and my older sister and i were like super close so i told her all about him and she just couldn't wait to meet him Real quick, I just want to give a big shout out to Lumino for sponsoring today's video. Lumino Whitening Kit is one of the best ways to whiten your teeth without paying hundreds of dollars, especially if you have sensitive teeth, this is the next best thing. Although I have veneers, they only cover the front of my teeth, so my teeth can still be very sensitive to certain chemicals that other brands use in their products. If you guys want to go check out their 7-pack for under $15, the link is in my bio. So whenever he met my sister, she was being super talkative to him, and I thought it was just because she was excited to meet him, like for part 2. Part two about how I found out my sister was hooking up with my boyfriend. So like I said, he came over, he met my sister, they got along super well. Fast forward, my parents decided to have a family gathering and my sister was like begging me to invite my boyfriend, which I didn't plan on inviting him at all because my family is super annoying and would make a big deal about the fact that this is my first boyfriend. She was like, okay, but if you guys are seriously in a relationship, I think that he should meet your family. So I ended up inviting him. So my mom called me to the kitchen to help pass out drinks which was super annoying because my sister was literally doing fucking nothing. So after I'm done with that, I'm looking for my boyfriend and he's nowhere to be found. So I go upstairs and as I'm about to walk up the stairs, both of them come down. And when I asked what was wrong, like why they were upstairs together, she was like, oh, I was showing him to the bathroom, which I felt super weird about. But because she was my sister, I let it go because you're supposed to trust your family. Stuff started part three about how my sister got with my boyfriend. So things started to get really sus because every time that he would come over, they would always find a way to be alone with each other. So fast forward, my sister and I are supposed to go to one of her friend's parties. The whole time though, she kept asking me if I would invite my boyfriend. And no offense, I love my boyfriend, but I need space away from him sometimes. And not to mention, I felt like I was dragging him around like a dog because she was the one who would want me to invite him everywhere. Fast forward, I end up inviting him to the party. My sister gets super drunk, really sick. And my boyfriend offers to take her to the bathroom. And I was like, excuse me, I'm her sister. I can do that. Thank you very much. So after I say that, my sister looks at me and she was like, I would appreciate it if you would just stop being like this because I feel super sick right now. Like, okay, play the victim. Anyway, so I go to check on them in the bathroom. They're not in there. And one of the bedroom doors was open. So when I went in there, I saw them doing the nasty. I asked her how long this had been going on. And she said it was, was since the first time that they met. And now I'm ignoring my sister until she goes to college. So how did the Heaven's Gate cult start? Well, it began in the 1970s under the leadership of Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles. Marshall first was in the U.S. Army and then after was a music professor at the University of Alabama. After, he went to Houston to go teach music and was on the board at the University of Thomas, but was fired for having a relationship with a male student. After his dad died, he was sent into a depression and was hospitalized at a psychiatric hospital. And there he met his nurse, Bonnie. And the second that Bonnie met him, she felt like the stars aligned. Even though she was married, she had been told by psychics frequently that she was going to meet a mysterious man who was tall with light hair and a fair complexion. And she felt like Marshall resembled this man. She worked out their little astrological charts together. A lot of their beliefs aligned as well, which included a mix of Christianity along with UFOs and aliens. So she figured that you couldn't argue with the stars. And she up and left her kids with her husband and went on a road trip with Marshall after he got out of the psychiatric hospital. And they went across the U.S. for six months sharing their beliefs. They started in Oregon and began their cult together. Part three on Heaven's Gate. So their first presentation happened in 1975 in Oregon. They handed out flyers that very much had Christianity mixed with sci-fi, mixed with conspiracy theory. And they had to even preface on the flyers that this wasn't a discussion about UFO sightings. But it did say that their presentation was two individuals who were sent from a level above human and will return to the level and spaceship UFO within the next few months. They were selling the premise that if you came with them on their road trip, they would be elevated to a new world and a better life called Tella. I'm pretty sure they were called human individual metamorphosis at the time. The 70s was really, really big on unconventional ideas. So lots of people would show up, but only a few people actually joined them. But the people that they did convince literally left their lives, their homes, their families to travel with them for over two decades. To join, they would have to go through a cleanse, which is drinking nothing but lemonade, cayenne pepper, and maple syrup for three months. They would give over their life savings so that they could travel from place to place and were basically told that they would be visited by aliens who would get 
give them their new bodies and they could collectively ascend to a spaceship. But this is not all. Four on Heaven's Gate. So a lot of the appeal with joining them came with the roots of Christianity. The Christian teaching spoke to a lot of the people's childhoods and upbringing and that the science fiction of it all kind of made it make more sense. For example, they would say Mary was impregnated by being taken up into a spacecraft. And I guess that made more sense than the original story. And if I'm being perfectly honest with you guys with the alien documents that are coming out, I totally understand the appeal of this cult. They were reportedly extremely kind and charismatic, but then they started to kind of abuse their power. One night in Texas, they told them that a visitation was coming and that everyone in the cult needed to go outside and wait. So everyone went outside, stayed up all night. And then in the morning, Bonnie and Marshall were like, hey, there's no visitation. This was actually a test to see if everyone was faithful. And I think they started to abuse their powers. What was so different with them than any other cult is that they actually allowed visitations they would let you leave if you wanted to you could call your family on mother's day and they basically just told their families that they were studying computers but around the 1990s the members went down to 26 and then bonnie passed away so marshall knew he had to get more followers five to the heaven's gate cult so bonnie's death honestly shook up the cult she had cancer and was told that she couldn't live much longer and she didn't really believe them and refused treatment so she died in 1985 marshall took it really hard and the cult members kind of realized the inconsistencies like wasn't she supposed to go up in a spacecraft have a new body or something like that so that's when marshall backtracks and says wait 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 human bodies are just the vehicles for our souls so we can essentially abandon them at any time bonnie left her body to return to her home among the tele beings so she can help them so instead of aliens helping us do this we now have the ability to leave our body at any time and in the 90s the internet was fairly new but let me tell you heaven's gate was so on top of this and they took over digital advertising they spent 30 grand posting an ad they would make videos to go along with their website they also created a web design firm called higher source and they used the money from this to rent a mansion outside of san diego and in october of 1996 they recorded two video messages offering viewers the last chance to evacuate earth before the comet hail bomb six to the heaven's gate cult so marshall's belief system kind of shifted a little bit again he basically told them that unaliving yourself would be the method to reach the next level and that everything human needs to be left behind including the body to ascend and a lot of the cult members were very competitive when it came to pleasing marshall who believed that sexual desire was a very bad thing so some of the members even opted for surgical castration well a comet called hail bop is about to pass by earth and Marshall essentially tells his cult members that it's now or never. He believes that there's a spaceship behind this comet with Bonnie in it coming to get them and that the government was suppressing this information from them. So in late March of 1997, the group isolated themselves and recorded their farewell videos that you can watch on YouTube still. And on March 22nd, they mixed sedatives with applesauce and washed it down with vodka. They then put bags over their heads to asphyxiate themselves and passed away. And they did this in shifts, which I can't even imagine how traumatizing that was. To literally put your friend's dead body in a bunk bed right before yours. And this is how the police found them. Follow my Instagram if you want more content and let me know what you want me to talk about next. 39 people were found dead in their bunk beds wearing matching track suits. They were found after an anonymous tip came in to the sheriff's department in San Diego. March 26th of 1997, the police were tipped off that there was some suspicious activity going on in a nearby mansion. A group of people had moved in and all of the windows were boarded up. The police went to go do a house check and found 39 people dead. Not only did all their track suits match, but so did their black and white Nike shoes. And they all had matching armbands that stated Heaven's Gate Away Team. This was the death of the Heaven's Gate cult and was the largest group death to occur involving U.S. citizens since the Jonestown Massacre. The death of this cult ended up being widely broadcasted everywhere, with the leader, Marshall Applewhite, even getting a cover on Time magazine. Very eerily on YouTube, you can look at a lot of Marshall's videos. I'll put in a clip of it now. This really leaves us with the question of how did this cult come about? And why did they make the decision to collectively take their own lives? Crime Fanatic Friday, how my sister tried to kill me and my younger siblings. Growing up, my sister Stacy was never mean. She adored me and my siblings and she was even like a mom to us since ours was mostly absent from our lives. We lived with my dad and grandma who did their best to make sure that we had a good relationship with our half siblings. My sister went to go live with our mom because she wanted a relationship with her. After this, I hardly ever saw her until one weekend when my grandma decided to let me go spend the weekend at my mom's. That weekend, my sister was crying out for help when she was beaten by my mom's boyfriend. She ran to my grandma's house who lives over an hour away but decided to come back. When she got back home, she was sick and throwing up blood. She asked my mom to take her to the ER but my mom just shrugged it off and told her that she was being dramatic. This is when my mom decided to go out drinking with her boyfriend and force my sister to babysit me and my younger siblings. I was five years old and my siblings were one, two, and four. My sister reached her breaking point and lost it. She completely trashed the trailer home and broke everything into pieces before turning her attention to us. She tied us up, gagged us with clothes, and duct tape over our mouths. This is when we heard gunshots followed by the smell of smoke before passing out. 
Crime Fanatic Friday Part 2, How My Sister Tried to Kill Me and My Younger Siblings. After smelling the smoke, my little sister and I passed out. I remember waking up in the ambulance and finding out that my older sister, Stacy, had found my mom's gun. She started firing it off at the ceiling of our home and then lit the couch on fire, trying to set fire to the trailer with us in it. Then she went outside and called the police. She told them that she had fallen asleep and two men had broken into our trailer trying to rob us. She told them that these men hit her in the head with a gun and when she regained consciousness, she ran outside because she smelled the smoke. Obviously, the police didn't buy any part of her story and she ended up confessing that she was tired of babysitting us, which is why she did it. She was put on trial when she was only 16 but got tried as an adult and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Stacy passed away last year from self-harm by means of hanging. She was only 25 years old. The news articles got all the details wrong and painted her in a bad light. Her life wasn't easy and she was crying out for help, but no one was listening. I've forgiven her for what she did. I love her and I wish that she rests in peace. This is why you should think twice before getting put to sleep at the dentist. I always had bad teeth growing up. When I was younger, I would stay up late eating candy and drinking soda without a care in the world. A few years later, my teeth needed some serious work. My mom didn't make a lot of money and also didn't care too much, so I never got them fixed as a kid. When I was 18, I got a job and made it a priority to fix my teeth with the money I earned. I did some research online for an affordable dentist and found one that would take my job subpar insurance. When I arrived for my first visit, I immediately noticed the office was worn down and old. From the moment I got there, something didn't feel right, but I chalked it up to being nervous because I was scared to see what the dentist had to say. I also couldn't help thinking about the potential pain of getting my teeth fixed. After the dentist made his initial assessment, I noticed he kept putting his hand on my shoulder as he was talking to me, which made me a little uncomfortable. He said I needed serious work done and advised me to be put to sleep to make it pain-free and easy, to which I agreed. I came in about a week later and was put to sleep while he worked on my teeth. I was pretty groggy when I woke up, but I noticed pretty quickly that something was wrong. I was terrified to realize that my bra was lifted up on one side of my chest. My experience only got worse from here. Part 2 Why You Should Think Twice Before Getting Put to Sleep at the Dentist A million things were going through my head when I woke up. I thought that maybe when I was groggy, I was moving around and my bra rode up on one side. I didn't want to believe that anything bad happened when I was put to sleep. I thought I was overthinking it and told myself that it sounded crazy, but it was lingering in the back of my mind. When I went back for my next appointment, I told my dentist that I wanted to stay awake. However, he kept arguing with me and trying to convince me to be put under again. I flat out told him that I was uncomfortable with being put to sleep for a second time and refused. He was annoyed and upset, which was a big red flag for me. I ended up just leaving and getting my work done somewhere else. I also filed a report of exactly what happened and what I experienced with this weirdo. A few months later, I received a call stating that the dentist I filed a complaint against was arrested. More information about my complaint was needed to build a case against him. It turns out this dentist and a few other staff in his office were abusing female patients that they put to sleep before working on them. Multiple patients filed complaints about this guy, which sparked the investigation. After this, his practice was shut down and his dental license was taken away. He ended up getting a much-deserved hefty prison sentence. This is why you should think twice about making your friend your surrogate. I always knew I wanted to have a few kids. I've dreamt of being a mom for as long as I can remember. However, due to a medical condition, carrying a baby isn't an option for me. I wasn't going to let this stop me, so I started looking into surrogacy. This process was really expensive and a lot harder than I thought. After months of searching, my best friend Ashley volunteered to be my surrogate for me and my fiance. She knew how much we wanted to start a family. I was so excited and extremely grateful. Ashley and I had been friends for eight years and I couldn't think of anyone better to be our surrogate. My fiance and I decided to ask Ashley to move in with us so that we could all be there for each other throughout the pregnancy. Everything was going great until it wasn't. Ashley started making a few comments to my fiance that made me really uncomfortable. One night, she asked him to give her a back massage. When he hesitated, she said to him, I'm carrying your child, you should do whatever I ask you to. I let this comment go even though it didn't sit right with me. Another night, she referred to herself as his baby mama, which made me furious. I told her she was overstepping and she laughed and told me she was just kidding. It only got worse from here. Part 2 Why You Should Think Twice About Making Your Friend Your Surrogate Ashley continued to overstep throughout the surrogacy process. One night, she told me she didn't like the name that I picked out for my baby and started giving me recommendations on what she thought the name should be. As it got closer to the due date, Ashley told me that she had thoughts about moving in permanently and raising the baby with my fiance and I, which was never part of the plan. When I shut that down, she seemed bitter. I could tell she had developed feelings for my fiance, which made it even more awkward. I knew I made a terrible mistake picking her as my surrogate. After my daughter was born, Ashley stayed with us for a little while longer, even though it wasn't part of our initial agreement. She wanted to spend every second holding our new baby girl, and I could tell that she was getting overly attached. We decided to tell Ashley our observations and told her that she had to move out before things got worse. She didn't take this well, and when she left, she told us that she didn't want to hear from us anymore. A couple years later, Ashley reached out to us and asked if she could come over and see us. When she came over, she told my daughter right in front of me that she was her real mom and that she'd find out when she was older. I couldn't believe it and immediately asked her to leave. Luckily, I haven't heard from her since. This is why you shouldn't use your real name online. When I was younger, I was really into meeting friends online and I always used my real name as my user on the websites. 
After I turned 18, I matched with someone that lived a few states away. His name was Matt and he was 21 years old. We quickly became friends and soon our friendship turned into a virtual friends with benefits situation. We talked all the time and sent risque photos over Snapchat. After a month, things started to shift. He quickly became extremely clingy and would get angry if I didn't text him back right away. I felt uncomfortable and distanced myself as his behavior escalated. Finally, I told him our friendship was no longer fun or healthy, apologized, and blocked him on everything. A couple days later, someone with my full name as their user added me on Snapchat. When I accepted, they started insulting me and I instantly knew it was Matt. He said he wanted to be with me and when I disagreed, the threat started. He sent my work and home address along with emails and numbers which belonged to different people I knew. He threatened to send all our conversations and my nudes to them. I was terrified and quickly blocked him but he kept making new accounts to harass me. Eventually, he stopped and I thought it was the end of it. Until one late night after work when I walked to my car and noticed a car parked facing mine with their high beams on. Part 2 Why You Shouldn't Use Your Real Name Online I ignored the car, got in mine, and drove off. Almost immediately, I noticed the car was following me. I decided to drive away from my house and then to a Walmart to lose this person in the busy aisles, but they were on my tail the whole time. Panic set in as I drove even further out. When we came to a red light, they switched lanes and came up right next to my car. I was so scared I didn't turn my head fully, but just a little to get a glance of who it was. I didn't need to see his whole face because I instantly knew it was Matt. He waved at me, but I looked forward the entire time. He had driven hundreds of miles just to stalk me. My heart was racing and I voice dialed my friend. A few lights down, I looked over and saw him wink and smirk at me and then finally take a right turn. I went to my friends and stayed the night. When I got home in the morning, my sister told me that someone dropped off roses for me in the middle of the night. When I plugged my phone in and checked, there he was with a new account to harass me again. As a last ditch effort, I lied to him and told him that I met someone else and that's why I couldn't talk to him anymore. For some weird reason, he respected this even though he was a little angry. I blocked him one last time, changed my user on all websites and have been careful ever since so you guys know jack the ripper right well this guy not only outlasted and outdid him but he put new york in one of the biggest states of fear and taunted investigators for years before we get into who he is and why i don't think he acted alone let's talk about what he did the first kill he ever made was stabbing two young girls on christmas eve of 1975 at this time new york was in absolute shambles people were being killed and assaulted all the time robberies were happening bodies were being found and the police really couldn't keep up with everything. So whenever this happened, it wasn't like a big news headliner. Well, a few months later, two girls were shot sitting in their car. Both of them ended up surviving, but it happened so fast that they didn't have any information on the suspect. Just some 44 caliber bullets left on scene. Well, the next attack occurred whenever this couple was sitting in a car. They reported that the whole car felt like it exploded and the girl looked over and saw a bullet wound in the guy's head. Because of the bullets used, the police were able to make the connections. Part two to the son of Sam. So the police noticed that the same shell casing was used and so far all victims were female with medium length brown hair well it did not take long for another attack to occur a man approached two women asking for directions when he asked he took out a gun and shot both of them leaving one paralyzed with a spinal injury and then after this came another couple sitting in a car the police having no leads were like okay we're gonna need to announce this to the public that we have a serial killer on our hands they released the few sketches that they did have, hoping for a lead. He was announced in the paper as the 44 caliber killer. The police also let the public know that he was looking for women with medium length brown hair. So many women during this time cut their hair, dyed it blonde, whatever, so that they didn't match this profile. After this came out, he ends up killing another girl on her way home from school and another couple who was sitting in their car on a date. But this killing was very different. This time, he actually left a letter for the police. I'm going to insert the letter. He introduces himself as the son of Sam. And his wording is just a little off. So the news decides to write him back. Part 3 to the son of Sam. So let me just talk a little bit more about this letter before we get into it. He obviously refers to his father as Sam and himself as the son of Sam. He paints his father as this very abusive figure that's essentially making him kill. He refers to himself as Beelzebub and as a brat. And we'll get to this later. So a very famous news article writer at the time named Jimmy Breslin writes to him begging him to stop. And not only does the son of Sam respond to him, but Jimmy publishes his response. This changed journalism. I'll put the response right here, but he uses words like from the gutter, Sam's creation. Meanwhile, the public is preparing for the anniversary of his first killing. Pepper spray has been sold out. Everyone is terrified and it just so happens on the anniversary, a blackout occurs looting, burning down neighborhoods, and all of the cops were working that night. But they got through the whole night without anything occurring. But not long after, another murder takes place. Robert and Stacy are attacked on their first date. Stacy is the only blonde that he ever attacked, but leaving her dead and Robert blind. After this, the police were able to collect five sketches, but all of them were different. Part four to the son of Sam. Well, a woman ends up calling the police reporting suspicious activity. She was going for a walk when she saw a man hopping into his car. Instead of continuing into his car, he hops out and starts to approach her. She sees him start to take an object out of a bag and she runs the opposite way and then hears gunshots. 
Learning about all the nearby crimes, she makes the report. She also noticed that he had a parking ticket on his car. So the police find the parking tickets from that day, from that area. Figures out the license and realizes the vehicle belongs to a guy named David Berkowitz. So the police call dispatchers inquiring about the ticket. And a dispatcher named Wee Carr answers the phone, saying that she was his neighbor. And says, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Berkowitz. He's a very strange man who shot my dog that belonged to my father, Sam. So the police were like, hmm, Sam. Well, they get to his house and break into his car without a search warrant. And they find a lot of evidence including a rifle, a map of the crime scenes, and a letter. So they wait for him to leave his apartment, and when he does, they ask him if he's David Berkowitz. And he responds with, no, I am the son of Sam, and you got me. Part five to the son of Sam. So once they found and arrested David Berkowitz, they brought him in for questioning. And it only took investigators 30 minutes to get him to admit to everything. And his reasoning behind the killings was because of a 6,000-year-old demon dog who was speaking to him through the dog of his neighbor. He was the one calling the shots and demanding him to kill. And one particular investigator that was very obsessed with this case named Maury Terry was wondering why he didn't match any of the sketches. It's normal for eyewitnesses to be wrong to some degree, but you wouldn't describe Berkowitz as being six foot and blonde. There was also some worry if the evidence would even hold up in court because they got it without a search warrant. But in court, David admitted to everything, so they didn't even need evidence. He was sentenced 25 years to life for each murder. So case closed, right? Well, if we look back to the letter, there's the name John Wheaties. Wee Carr and John Carr are Sam Carr's children, Berkowitz's neighbors. And from looking at the eyewitness sketches, the sketches look more like John Carr, Sam's actual son. Story time about how my grandma almost got me grounded. So a little background information, I was 14 and in eighth grade. And there was this boy that I really liked who lived like 10 minutes away from me. So the one night he asked me if I wanted to hang out. And my mom was strict about me not hanging out with people after 7 o'clock at night. Especially a boy. I wasn't even allowed to hang out with boys. And my grandma, my mom, and my brother and I all lived together. And we all had our own rooms. Mine was on the first floor of the house. So I snuck out the window and I went and hung out with him. So I snuck out at around 3 and came back at around 4 a.m. And my grandma comes into my room to wake me up for school. And I guess that I had been laying on my side and my hair was like pulled up because literally all I remember waking up to is her smacking me up out of my sleep and screaming at me because there was a hickey on my neck. She's like, I'm telling your mom whenever she gets home, your window's gonna be screwed shut. And I keep telling her it's not a hickey, so she calls my brother over. And he's like, yeah, that's definitely a hickey because he likes to kiss her ass. Like for part two. Part two about how my grandma almost got me grounded. So like I said, she's like, I'm telling your mom and I keep telling her that it's not a hickey. And thankfully my mom already went to work. She had work at 6 a.m. So I got on the bus, I go to school and I'm talking to my friend and telling her about how I'm literally gonna be crucified whenever I get home. And she told me about how her older sister was in like the same situation that I'm in now. So she texted her older sister asking what she did because she never got caught. And I was like, okay, well, if she used makeup, my mom's gonna find out because she's not dumb. Well, apparently her older sister burnt herself with a curling iron. Yes, literally burnt herself, but she ended up getting away with it. So fast forward, I get home at around three o'clock and I sneak in through the back door so that way my grandma won't see that I came in the house because she literally would have made me sit in the living room until my mom got home. So I go upstairs and I burn myself with a curling iron, which is not fun. Like for part three. Part three about how my grandma almost got me grounded. So like I said, I snuck in through the back door so that way my grandma wouldn't see me because if she saw me, she would have made me wait in the living room with her until my mom got home. So, you know, burnt myself with a curling iron and my mom gets home. And since I'm on the first floor, I can literally hear my grandma talking to my mom and my brother, of course. My grandma's like, yeah, she has hickeys all over her neck, which is literally an exaggeration because there was one, one small one. So my mom calls me out to the living room. I go out and she's like, all right, show it to me. And I'm like, show you what? She's like, don't play stupid. Your grandma already told me the whole situation. And I was like, mom, I literally burnt myself with a curling iron. And my grandma's like screaming and freaking out because I'm lying. She's like, you better tell your mother the truth right now. Da -da 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 -da. So I show the burn to my mom. She looks at my grandma and she's like, so you're going to tell me that's not a burn on her neck? And she was like, that's not how it looked this morning, blah, blah, blah. So I got away with it. But now my grandma literally stalks me to see if I'm doing anything wrong so she can tell my mom. Why does the entirety of the Denver International Airport have barbed wire facing inwards? Almost like a prison, it's trying to keep something in. The Denver International Airport is home to so many conspiracy theories. I went there several times within my own traveling. And whether you believe the conspiracy theories or not, it is so hard to argue that the entire airport is not suspicious. 
DIA was built as a replacement to the Stapleton Airport, even though nothing was wrong with the airport before. It was supposed to be done in 1993, but it didn't end until 1995, the final budget being $4.8 billion. And if you guys don't know this, that exceeds normal airport price. And to put it into even more perspective, this airport and its grounds are bigger than Manhattan. So what was the purpose of making it so big and expensive? The builders for the DIA worked under multiple contractors, so it's rumored that no one knows the true scope of this project. But maybe the architects wanted it this way. It's filled with strange markings, underground tunnels, and apocalyptic themes. So the first thing that I'm going to be starting with is Blucifer. I feel like a lot of people already know about this demon-eyed horse that stands out in front. The reason that Blucifer got his name, his actual name is just Blue Mustang, was because he ended up killing his creator. As he was building, the head ended up falling off, hitting his leg, cutting into an artery. And to add to the creepiness, it has red glowing eyes whenever you look at it from a certain angle. So everyone in Colorado pretty much just refers to it as Blucifer. Many people think that the red eyes are a nod to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but an artist said it's just to honor the wild spirit of the American West. Weird. Also in the front of the airport, there's a tile with a picture of a cart on it. In the cart, it says A-U-A-G, like for silver and gold. But some people think that this is referring to a deadly strain of hepatitis called Australian antigen, which is believed to be a part of biological warfare. And while I originally thought that this was kind of far, the man who discovered Australian antigen was actually a part of the team that founded the airport. And there's more that stays on this apocalyptic theme. Welcome to the next part of Denver International Airport. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the Great Hall. In there, there is a plaque with the dedication for the airport on there. And they dedicated it to the New World Airport Commission, which is an organization that doesn't even exist or has ever existed. So why would this even be a dedication? Under this capstone, there is a time capsule. This is set to be open in 2094, but no one knows what's inside of it. There are symbols and markings in this said to be dedicated to the Freemasons, which carry their own separate theories about being linked to the Illuminati. A lot of people also say that from an aerial view, the airport looks like a swastika. But honestly, I don't really think it's noticeable unless you're really, really looking for it. And the other things is the creepy murals. These were designed by Leo Tanguma. One is called World Dream of Peace, and the other is in peace and harmony with nature. However, they're depicting themes of death and again, apocalyptic times. I'm pretty sure a soldier stabbing a dove means the exact opposite of peace. And there's literally children in caskets, but don't worry, it doesn't stop there. Welcome back to Denver International Airport. So the next thing we're going to do is talk about the tunnels. There are six underground layers and possibly more. And it's thought that the tunnels that exist underneath go all the way from Colorado Springs Air Force Base to the Air Force Base on Cheyenne Mountain. There's theorized to be bunkers down here and that it's potentially made as a safe place for the world's elite during the apocalypse. A huge part of this theory lies with author Alex Christopher. She met some people at a conference in Denver who were able to take her down to the tunnels. She took her friend Phil Schneider with her. And down there, they were able to get pictures... I'll insert them here, but not long after this, Schneider apparently unalived himself, which again, after coming out with this information, is extremely suspicious. Also, there was five buildings that were originally built for the airport, but didn't quite work out. So instead of destroying these buildings, they just buried them and then continued to build on top of them. Even the constructor was very confused on why he was requested to do this. So because of this, how do we know how many extra buildings or hangars there are? And what exactly are the specific conspiracy theories surrounding this apocalyptic themed airport? So what exactly are people theorizing involving the Denver International Airport? Well, the two huge ones is that it's either connected to the Illuminati or to the apocalypse and may even potentially be the Illuminati headquarters. So the Freemasons have so many conspiracy theories surrounding them about them being linked to the Illuminati. And there's several Freemason markings around this airport. The airport is also just so expensive and maybe they got their funding from the Illuminati. The exchange may have been money for headquarters and the tunnels make it very, very easy to move in and out. And if you're a secret society running the nation, why wouldn't you be located at an airport? The other theory, like I stated before, is that this is for the apocalypse. To keep the elite inside. Just because of how the tunnels are set up in the rumored bunkers, and with all of the hints being around the airport, and the Australian antigen, it's giving us very much apocalyptic New World Order vibes. But also the barbed wire facing in is very concentration camp-like. Either way, this airport has fully embraced these conspiracy theories. They have an animatronic gargoyle that sits out in front and talks to you about them. Which, making a joke about it, would be the easiest way to cover it. Story time about how I almost got kidnapped at a grocery store. So a little background information, I was 16 and it was during the summertime. And I was super excited because I had just got my license. But my parents had this idea that if they made me drive around and do all their errands, that I would be a better driver. So I was pretty much like their B-I-T-C-H. 
Anyway, so the one night my mom wanted to make this recipe that she saw on TikTok and she didn't have the right seasonings for it. So who did she tell to go to the store? Yours truly, me. And on Sundays, the mini market that was in our town would close at four o'clock. So I had to drive like 30 minutes away to the nearest Target. And when I got there, I had to park in the back because they had like 10 handicap spaces up front another 10 for when you sit there and they bring your shit out to you and another five whenever you're picking something up that you already ordered but in all honesty that didn't bother me because i had never heard about any girls getting trafficked at a grocery store like for part two part two about how i almost got kidnapped at a grocery store so like i said i parked all the way in the back of the parking lot i mean okay not all the way in the back but i was damn near close so I go in and I'm not too familiar with this Target. I've only been here a few times because the mini market in my hometown is usually the one that I go to. So I'm looking around and I realize that there's this little girl following me. But it seemed like she was more like keeping an eye on me. Like she would stand like 20 feet behind me, but just like stare at me, you know, peek through the aisles. And she had did that for like 10 minutes. But whenever I finally went up to the checkout, she was gone and this woman came up to me. She was like, oh my gosh, have you seen my daughter? She was running around the store. I don't know where she is. So I described the little girl to her that I saw. And she was like, yeah, that's her. I can't find her. Will you please help me look for her? And I didn't have the time for this because my parents were going to wring my neck. But I said, okay. Part three about how I was almost kidnapped at a grocery store. So like I said, she asked me to help look for her daughter. And I was like, I'm going to go tell a Target employee. And she was like, no, don't worry. They're all already looking. They have security all over the place. And she was like, will you help me check the parking lot? Because I don't know if she left. She was like, I've been having them look for the past 10 minutes. So I didn't think anything of this because I didn't think that some lady would try to kidnap me. So I went into the parking lot with her and I'm like, okay, where do you think she would have went? Like, did you drive here? Did she maybe go to the car? And she was like, no, we live like five minutes down the road. Do you think that we could get in your car and drive around? And I said, yeah, because I thought that it would speed up the process. And my dad's truck was really high off the ground. So while we're walking, I'm like, I think someone's under my car. And she was like, what? No, 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 no. It's probably just the shadow. And I'm like, no, there's someone under my car. So I turn around to walk back into the store and she starts like pulling my arm towards my car. So an employee called the police whenever I went in there. And long story short, they were trying to kidnap me. One of the most terrifying cults that I have learned about recently refers to themselves as the children. And the reason that they terrify me so much is because they are related to so many other cults. Well, Scientology came about in 1953. And two members from this church, Robert D. Grimson and Marianne McLean, decided to leave it and start the Cult of the Process Church of the Final Judgment. And they brought their satanic teachings to the U.S. around the 1970s. Well, if you guys watched my previous video about the Son of Sam killings, which occurred in New York City around the 1970s, you might be able to connect these two things together. Well, the issue with this case is that one man was convicted. But it seems as though police really fudged this up. There was so much attention around this case that they were just looking to just put someone behind bars instead of actually doing full investigations. Well, one editor named Maury Terry ended up taking investigating into his own hands. And not only was he able to find a substantial amount of evidence and cryptic messages, but he was also able to find where the cult would meet up for their rituals, Devil's Cave. Part two to why I don't think the son of Sam worked alone. Well, it was rumored that there was a cult working in New York City that was an offshoot of the process church of the final judgment. They referred to themselves as the children and ended up in Yonkers. Well, when Maury was doing his investigating, he was let known by several people that their rituals were done in Untermyer Park, an estate that used to be absolutely beautiful. But as you can see from the pictures, there's now an abandoned pump house. And when investigating this, trigger warning, they found blood on the walls and blood on the ceiling. In symbolic writing, not only this, but dead animals were everywhere, including specifically dogs. So then it was time to look back at David's letters, in which he made cultural references to Beelzebub, which is the demon known as Lord of the Flies, and Brat, which is a small devil. He also ended his letter as From the Gutters, which was quite literally the nickname for the abandoned pump house. And when holding how he signed his name at the end of the letters to the mirror, you can find the words Sam and Carr and Burke in it. So where were the actual sons of Sam and why hadn't they been questioned? Part three to why I don't think the son of Sam worked alone. Well, after Maury had taken an investigation into his own hand and was seeing all these connections, he went to the police with it. And he was essentially just told to shut it down. That they had their man behind bars, there's no way other people worked with him. Even though there was clear indications that he was working with a cult, 
and none of the eyewitness sketches even looked like him. So the last thing to do would be able to tie the sons of Sam to the actual case. So John, Michael, and Wheat Carr were all the kids of Sam, Michael and John specifically being the sons. After talking to neighbors, there were several stories about Sam beating them. Their father Sam struggled with alcoholism, and this was all included in the letter that David wrote. So Maury's like, okay, let's go do investigating in the place that they were from, my not North Dakota. And when they got to their hometown, they were told by everyone that they were legitimately cult leaders. There was accounts of them sacrificing dogs, drinking blood, all the work. So Maury was like, okay, we need to actually get a hold of these guys. Maybe they'll be open to talking about it. But soon after that, it was reported that they both mysteriously died. Part four to why I don't think the son of Sam worked alone. So how did the other suspects mysteriously die, you might be asking? Well, one randomly unalived himself, while the other died in a mysterious car crash which is entirely suspicious. So after adding all of this evidence together, they were able to release it to the public. And it made sense that Berkowitz would have had other people watching, other people holding the gun, other people doing the killings, all orchestrated by a cult leader. But because their main suspects for this case were now dead, there wasn't really much that they could do. Maury was trying to prevent this from happening again, though. Like, what if the children decide to send another member of theirs out? Either way, their parent cult, the Process Church of the Final Judgment, was neighbors to Charles Manson and is where he got many of his own foundational ideas for his cult. So it's so clear that these connections run deep. Let me know what you guys think of this case. Let me know if there's anything in this that you want me to talk about next, like Scientology or Charles Manson, or if you want to hear more about the Process Church of the Final Judgment. Either way, follow my Instagram for more content. Story time. My boyfriend cheated on me with the girl best friend. So a little background information. I was 17 and a junior in high school, and my boyfriend and I had been dating for a year. But just a little backstory about when we got together. So there were definitely some red flags that I missed, okay? One of them being that he had a girl best friend. And I don't care what y'all have to say if that makes me insecure or what. But coming from someone who has been the girl best friend, I knew this was not good at all. Especially whenever we first started dating and she was still being super friendly with him. Meaning she would hold his hand, she would hang on him 24-7. And when I told him I was super uncomfortable with that and I felt like there needed to be some boundaries. He was like, um, yeah, I told you what it was whenever we got together. So if you don't like that, then just break up with me. Looking back on it now, that was also a red flag because I feel like he was telling me to break up with him so that way he didn't have to break up with me, like for part two. Part two about how my boyfriend cheated on me with the girl best friend. So like I said, she would still hang all over him and he pretty much told me, if you don't like that, then you can leave. Obviously, I did not want to leave because I liked him and he was my boyfriend. So I just kept putting up with it. And eventually, you know, we got six months into our relationship. So at that point, I'm thinking maybe I have a little bit more authority, you know, to be like, hey, I don't like the way that she acts around you. You guys can't hang out like that anymore. And they would hang out alone together. He would take her to dinner. Which I literally tried telling him that the stuff that they do together is relationship stuff. And he was like, that's not true at all because we did all this stuff before you and I even got together. So anyways, like I said, six months in, I'm like, hey, I don't like the way that you guys are hanging around each other. Once again, he gives me the same excuse. So he pretty much said that he didn't care. And the one night him and I were supposed to hang out, but he canceled on me last minute. And her and I didn't get along and she never Snapchatted me before. But then I get a Snapchat of her and him making out at his house. This is why you should be careful doing private events as a stripper. I worked as a dancer for a few years. Most nights I worked at the club, but sometimes I did private events to make some extra money. I always took one of the bouncers that I knew from the club as my bodyguard and gave him a cut of what I made. I also only agreed to small events with a max of 10 to 15 people. One day a guy called me and booked me for a small birthday party for his brother. I explained the rules. No touching or grabbing, nothing sexual would be happening, and I only do what I'm comfortable with, to which he said he understood. I picked up my bouncer friend Tank and headed out to the event. When we arrived, we immediately noticed it was a huge party of at least 60 to 70 people, all of them being men. Tank asked me if I was still comfortable dancing for the party and I agreed since we were already there. The group of men were really loud when I walked in and they were extremely intoxicated, which was the first red flag. A few guys instantly started touching me and Tank lightly pushed them away, telling them no touching and that the show hasn't started yet. While we were walking to the bathroom to change, another guy grabbed my butt. Tank pushed him off and started arguing with him. At this point, we should have left and if I knew what was about to go down, we would have. Part two, why you should be careful doing private events as a stripper. 
I went to the bathroom to change into my dancing clothes and get ready. I could hear the guys asking where I was and getting hyped up. I went to the living room where I'd be performing and started dancing for the party. I got close to the birthday boy and a few guys started aggressively grabbing me in places they shouldn't. I looked over and saw Tank leaning over the couch, warning the guys to stop touching me. A few drunk guys came up to Tank, put their hands on his chest, and pushed him back, telling him not to worry about me. I could tell things were about to go downhill fast. When the song finished, I told him I was going to change my outfit, grab Tank, and rush to the bathroom. Tank told me it was time to go and said we should sneak out through the open garage door. I quickly got dressed and we snuck into the garage. The guys instantly noticed we were leaving and pursued us. As we were running for the open garage door, it began to close on us. We were barely able to make it out. About 15 guys ran out after us and Tank told me to run to the car. As I was running, I looked back and saw Tank pull out a gun and tell them not to come any closer as he was backing up. Luckily, he was able to get to the car with me and we sped off. After this incident, I stopped doing private events. Story time of how I was almost abducted and caught by a serial killer. In February of 2012, I decided to visit my grandfather's grave because it was his birthday. His passing was really hard for me to deal with because he had just died the previous year in March and the wounds were still pretty fresh. It was daytime and I was kneeling in front of his grave with my head down. I was mourning and crying as I thought of our memories together. However, something didn't feel right. For some reason, a sense of urgency filled my stomach. I could somehow tell something bad was about to happen, but I didn't know what. The area around the cemetery was covered in woods. In that moment, I looked up to see a man full on sprinting from the woods in my direction. Although I was in shock, I forced myself to get up and run as fast as possible towards my truck. By the time I made it to my truck, he had gotten about 50 feet from me. I jumped in and locked the doors instantly. That's when he stopped and threw his hands up in the air in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started my truck and slammed my foot on the gas pedal, driving right past him. Our eyes were locked and neither of us broke eye contact for a second. I got a really good look at his face. At first, I thought I was your average weirdo, but little did I know I was looking into the face of one of the most notorious serial killers. Part 2 How I was almost abducted and caught by a serial killer a few years after this incident, I was at work, bored out of my mind, and decided to download an app. This app had a ton of paranormal, cryptid, serial killer, and UFO articles. As I was browsing through the serial killer articles, I came across one that made my heart drop into my ass. Israel Keys. He was widely known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body, and dumping the pieces into a frozen lake. He would travel across the U.S. bearing kill kits in places long before he ever committed the crimes. After he murdered Samantha Koenig in Alaska, he traveled to Texas for a wedding in a city not too far from where I live and disappeared for a bit. Not even his own family knew where he was. He was arrested in Lufkin and brought to a city one over from me before he was extradited back to Alaska to stand trial. A year ago, I found a book on him and read about his crimes. At the end of the book, he describes some of his favorite places to abduct people were public parks and cemeteries. I often wonder if there's a kill kit buried in the woods of the cemetery that he tried to abduct me in. You were fast, Israel, but I think that my grandfather was watching out for me that day because I was faster. Story time about how someone broke in when I was babysitting. When I was in high school, I worked as a babysitter to make some extra cash. I posted flyers in the city I lived in with my rates and my number. For the most part, everything was always fairly normal, but that was about to change. One day, I got a call from a woman who asked if I could babysit her two kids on a Saturday, but she asked if I could stay overnight as she wouldn't be back in town until the next morning. I had never done an overnight job, but she offered to pay me triple of my regular rates and said I wouldn't have to cook as she would leave money so I could order pizza. After getting my parents' approval, I agreed. At the time, I didn't have a car, so my parents dropped me off. When I went inside, she greeted me, explained the house rules, and went on her way. Luckily, I instantly hit it off with the kids, and they even showed me their secret hiding spot, which was a small hidden room inside of their closet. After the pizza arrived, I heard the doorbell ring again. When I opened the door, two men were standing there. They were asking for directions, and I know it wasn't smart to say, but I told them that I was babysitting for the night and didn't know the area too well. I apologized, wished them a good night, and closed the door. About an hour after putting the kids to bed, I was in the living room watching TV when I was startled by the sound of screams coming from the kids' bedroom. Part 2 of how someone broke in while I was babysitting. I quickly rushed to the kids' bedroom. They were huddled in a corner, holding each other and terrified. I asked them what happened and they told me that there were two men standing by their window. However, when I looked outside of their window, I didn't see anyone. That's when I heard the doorbell ring. I told the kids to go hide in their secret spot while I went to check it out. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and walked towards the door. When I looked through the door hole, I saw two figures walking away from the door. I was fully creeped out at this point and I ran to the living room looking for my phone. That's when I heard a loud bang at the door and I knew someone was trying to break in. I couldn't find my phone so I sprinted to the secret hiding spot and told the kids that they'd have to be quiet but everything would be okay. I heard footsteps coming from the hall and two men speaking to each other. I could hear them tossing and turning everything in the house looking for us. At one point, I held my breath as one of them opened the closet door and shifted things around, but then closed it and left. I heard one of the men telling the other one that it was time to go. Shortly after this, we heard police sirens followed by the police calling out to us. Turns out a neighbor had heard the commotion and called the police. Unfortunately, even with all the information I gave them, they never found who broke in. Luckily, we were all safe, but I stopped babysitting after this. Story time about how I caught my boyfriend with the girl he told me not to worry about. When I was a sophomore in high school, I had been dating a guy for a while. Even though we were never official, we were exclusive because we'd post each other on social media and everyone knew what it was. Six months into our relationship, he invited me to his friend's party. We were drinking, dancing, playing games, and having a good time. 
At one point while I was hanging out with him and his friends, he said that he had to go to the bathroom and that he was going to use the porta potty. However, 45 minutes had gone by and he wasn't back yet, but I just assumed he had gotten sidetracked with one of his other friends. I ended up having to break the seal, so I headed to the porta potty and when I opened the door, I saw him and another girl inside. I recognized her because she had sent him nudes before, but immediately messaged saying it was an accident. She was on her knees in the porta potty, giving him a BJ. I instantly bolted away from them, and as I was running away, I could hear her calling me a B for barging in on them. My friends took me back home and consoled me while I drunk cried. He messaged everyone besides me that night, asking where we went because we were his ride home. Shortly after this, I went to another party and I ran into him, but he played it off like he didn't know me. However, I heard he got into some bad things, and now I guess he's doing crack. So I'm really happy that I dodged a bullet.